Today, we'd like to invite you to pray with us at the Stations of the Cross. Today, we'll be using Pocket Guide to the Stations of the Cross by Dr. Shree. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Dear Jesus, where did everyone go on Good Friday? Where are the crowds who praised you? Where were the people who sought miracles from you? Where were the disciples who followed you? All the people who had benefited so much from you throughout your public ministry are nowhere to be seen. They have abandoned you. You are left almost completely alone. Today I want to be close to you. I want to be among the few faithful ones like your mother, Mary, the beloved disciple St. John, and St. Mary Magdalene. I want to walk closely with you step by step to Calvary. Help me to notice every word, every gesture, every glance. Give me the grace to love you and comfort you in your suffering. May my careful devotion to you in these 14 stations of the cross help make up in a small way for the lack of love I have shown you countless times throughout my life. I love you, Jesus. Help me to love you more. The first station. Jesus is condemned to death. We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you. Because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. Condemned. How could Jesus be condemned, the one who is so perfectly innocent, so full of love? How could he of all people be condemned? He did not come to condemn, but to offer forgiveness and mercy to everyone. And now the very people he came to save reject their Savior and condemn him to death. He is sentenced to crucifixion, the punishment reserved for those who rebel against the Roman Empire. Think about the injustice of it all. Jesus challenged us to be peacemakers, to love our enemies, and to pray for those who persecute us. Now he is accused of being a violent revolutionary. Yet in the face of many harsh words and false accusations, Jesus remains silent. Why does he not defend himself? Why doesn't he explain and prove them wrong? There is an important lesson he is teaching us, the lesson of humility. The eternal Son of God, the divine judge, who will come again to judge the living and the dead, humbly submits to this injustice and allows himself to be falsely condemned. Let us pray. Dear Jesus, in our fallen world, I know I will sometimes be misunderstood by the people around me, my colleagues, my friends, my relatives. They might not always have an ac accurate perception about what I do. They might misinterpret my motives. They might accuse me of being at fault when I really didn't do anything wrong. Especially in our secular world, faithful followers of Jesus will often be misunderstood as being too religious or too rigid for holding basic Christian beliefs. In those moments, help me to remember your example on Good Friday. Though I may not be able to change people's perceptions of me, I can control how I respond. Help me to see these situations as opportunities to stand with you, Jesus to unite myself with you and share a bit in your passion. Help me to have the wisdom to know when to speak and when it is better to remain silent and humbly surrender to the painful misunderstandings and false accusations that come my way. The second station, Jesus takes his cross. We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you. Because by your holy cross, you have redeemed the world. Jesus was not forced to carry the cross. He is the divine Son of God. No one can force him to do anything. Jesus freely chose to embrace the cross. The Savior of the world humbly submits himself to the Roman soldiers and picks up the heavy cross upon which they will crucify him. But why? Jesus is revealing to us the mystery and beauty of self-giving love. God made us in such a way that we will find fulfillment in life only when we learn to give ourselves away in love, to make ourselves a gift of love to God and to others. Though the world entices us to seek our identity and happiness in popularity, success, comfort, or pleasure, that kind of grasping will never satisfy the deepest desires in our hearts. We were made to live for others. We were made for self-giving love. Jesus teaches us that unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone, but if it dies, it bears much fruit. Now he teaches us with this example. 
he embraces the cross and will give up his life as a gift of love to the Father. In doing so, he reveals the secret to true human flourishing, the mystery of self-giving love. Let us pray. Dear Jesus, help me to love like you did. Too often, I seek my identity and security in things that do not really matter and will not offer the security I long for. No matter how much I am liked and followed, no matter how much success I achieve or fun times I experience, my heart will be restless, always hungering for more, until it learns to rest in you. Help me to find myself by giving myself away in love to you and the people around me. Help me to embrace the mystery of the cross. The third station, Jesus falls for the first time. We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you. Because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. The tradition of Jesus falling three times recalls the fall of Adam and the threefold wounded state of our humanity, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. We can see in each of, of Jesus' falls how he lovingly meets us in our weakness to heal us and free us from the heavy weight of our sins. The heaviest sin Jesus carries on his way to Calvary is our pride. But we should not think of pride as merely being boastful or arrogant. Pride is found whenever we rely more on ourselves than on God. Jesus wants us to live in the truth of how much we depend on him for everything, for our happiness, our relationships, our well-being, our sanctification. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Do we live our lives each day as if everything depended on God? Do we turn to Him moment by moment, seeking His help and guidance, truly relying on the Lord for all we do? Or do we tend to rely more on ourselves, our own effort, planning, and skills? Do we truly seek His will for our lives? Or do we tend to cling to our own dreams and plans, pridefully pursuing our own will? The humble soul uses his life not for his own purposes, but for God's. The humble, soul is, the humble soul is so convinced at the core of its being of how little he can do on his own and how much he must depend on God. Let us pray. Dear Jesus, the weight of the cross crushes you. You fall because of the weight of my pride. I want to lessen your burden in, the, in this first fall. Help me, Jesus, to place my trust in you and not in myself. Help me to seek your will and not my own. I love you, Jesus, and don't want you to fall again because of my pride. The more I learn to lean on you, and the more I surrender my life into your hands, the lighter is the burden of the cross you carry. The fourth station, Jesus meets his mother. We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you. Because by your holy cross, you have redeemed the world. About 33 years before Good Friday, the angel told Mary that her child would be the long-awaited Messiah King, who would rescue God's people and establish the kingdom of God. Now she sees her son mocked, scourged, condemned to death, and forced to carry his heavy, this heavy cross on his way to being executed. From a human perspective, the events of Good Friday seem to be the exact opposite of what God's messenger told her at the Annunciation. What happened? Why did things turn out this way? Where is God in the midst of all this? From a human standpoint, this would be reasonable questions to ask. But as Mary meets her son one last time before he reaches Calvary, she already faces her own kind of spiritual crucifixion. The words of Simeon echo in her heart, a sort of a sword will pierce through your, soul, your own soul also. She is being invited to trust that the horrific murder of her own flesh and blood is somehow a part of God's plan. She is being invited to renew her fiat, her, her complete surrender, by consenting even to his cruel death on a cross. Amid the darkness surrounding Mary at this moment, the light of faith still shines in her soul. She clings to faith in her son's words that he must go to Jerusalem and be killed and on the third day be raised. As St. Teresa of Calcutta, Mother Teresa, once wrote, 
at the foot of the cross, Our Lady saw only pain and suffering, and with a close to tomb, she could not even see the body of Jesus. But it was then that Our Lady's faith, her loving trust, and total surrender were greatest. Let us pray. Dear Mary, as you walk closely with your Son on the way of the cross, you draw even closer to us. We see your sorrowful heart. We see how much is being asked of you. We see your total trust and surrender. When we face our own trials, may we remember yours. When we are called to sacrifice and abandon ourselves to the Father's will, may we also give our fiat. When we stand in the darkness and wonder where God is leading us, may we cling to the truth of His love, even though we may not feel it. You, who are so beautiful and so perfect, still remain human, one of us, sharing in our sufferings. Pray for us, Mary, that we may always say yes to God's will, now and all the way up to the hour of our death. The Fifth Station Simon of Cyrene helps Jesus carry his cross. We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you. Because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. For crucifixions, the Romans forced the condemned man to carry his own cross. It would be highly unusual for them to allow another person to carry it. But Jesus was so, so severely beaten up during his torturous scourging that he is already near death before he even reaches Calvary. He cannot even carry his cross. The soldiers would never think of carrying it, given the shame associated with the act. So they press into service a man coming in from the country named Simon of Cyrene. Notice how Simon did not volunteer to help Jesus. He was forced to do it. He and his two sons were probably among the thousands of pilgrims arriving in Jerusalem for the Passover festival. He likely had many hopes and plans for that day. But everything was turned upside down when the Roman soldier forced him to carry Jesus' cross. Scripture reveals one important detail about Simon. He shouldered the cross and carried it behind Jesus, an image of discipleship. Jesus several times taught that if anyone wishes to be his disciple, he must take up his cross and follow him. This is what Simon is doing. He is picking up the cross and following Jesus. The Gospel is subtly pointing to what the early church came to know. Simon of Cyrene was transformed through this encounter with Christ. He became a Christian disciple through this unexpected cross. Let us pray. Dear Jesus, help me to find you in the many unexpected crosses that come up in life. When a car breaks down, a child becomes ill, a friend lets me down, a lost job, a lost relationship, a feeling of being lost in life. These are not just problems to be solved or sorrows to be carried. These are opportunities to find you, Jesus, at a deeper level. In your providence, you can bring good in my soul, even from these sufferings. Help me, Lord, not to run away from the unexpected crosses in my life. Help me to see how you are inviting me to grow through them. Help me not to complain, get anxious or frustrated, but to ask you, what are you trying to teach me? What are you trying to, sh uh, to show me? And like Simon of Cyrene, may I be transformed by, by picking up the cross and following you. The Sixth Station Veronica wipes the face of Jesus. We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you. Because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. As Jesus stumbles along the streets on his way to Calvary, a woman pushes through the angry crowds, unhindered by the brutality of the soldiers. She is driven by love. She approaches Jesus and does nothing more than hold out a veil to wipe the blood and sweat of his holy face. It is a small gesture of kindness, but even the littlest acts of love leave their mark in this world. According to popular tradition, an image of the face of Christ was miraculously left imprinted on the veil. This is an important lesson for us. The smallest acts of love, a smile, an act, of, an act of service, a word of encouragement, a humble silence instead of a complaint. These do not pass away. They are imprinted in our hearts and make us more like Jesus. Indeed, the woman's name points to the, this mystery of love. Her name is Veronica, which means true image. 
vera icona. Her act of love did not just leave an image of Christ on her cloth that day. It impressed the image of Christ in her heart. Similarly, when we perform little acts of love, whether with our families, friends, colleagues, or the poor, we become changed into Christ's likeness. We become true images of Christ to others. Let us pray. Dear Jesus, help us to be like Veronica and be attentive to the many opportunities you give us to love our neighbor in small ways, anticipating their needs, expressing gratitude, honoring them, making small sacrifices for them, giving in to their preferences. Our love can grow in big ways through little acts of kindness. May the people we encounter each day see not just us, but your face shining through us. The Seventh Station Jesus falls for the second time. We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you. Because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. Jesus falls again. The comfort of seeing his mother, the help of Simon of Cyrene, and the kindness of Veronica are not enough to keep him upright. He falls a second time under the weight of our sins. Let us consider how a second part of the threefold fall of humanity, how our covetousness crushes Jesus on his way to Calvary. It saddens Jesus when we seek our security in life, not in him, but in the passing things of this world, a job, a position, enough savings, and certain possessions. It grieves him when we seek our identity in worldly praise, social status, the latest technology, and the current fashion. It is particularly painful for Jesus when we view our wealth and possessions primarily as our own, to do, to do with as we please, rather than as gifts to be lovingly used to serve others, especially the poor and suffering. As you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. Only Jesus can satisfy our deepest yearnings. If we pour our energies into grasping after money, fashion, gadgets, and, and the praises, honors, and comforts of this world, our hearts will never be at rest. The lust of the eyes makes us a slave to hankering after one more thing. And each time we seek our identity and fulfillment in these, we add to the burden Jesus carries for us on his way to Calvary. Let us pray. Dear Jesus, the modern world pressures us constantly to run after one more purchase, one more click, one more salary increase, one more honor, and then gets us to do it all over again and again. The cycle is exhausting and empty. It distracts us from the things that matter most in life, friendship, family, and most of all you. No amount of money, honor, praise, or possessions will ever satisfy the deepest desires in our hearts. Only you can do that. Please help me not to seek my peace and security in these passing things of this world. I wish to seek first the kingdom of God and trust that if I do that, you will provide for all I need. I put my trust in you, not in my possessions. The Eighth Station Jesus meets the woman of Jerusalem. We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you. Because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. After getting up from his second fall, Jesus presses forward toward, toward Calvary. Along the way, he has one last encounter with some kind faces that ease his burden. It is a group of women who are mourning over Jesus being sent to be crucified. The women had come to love Christ and put their hopes in him, but now all seems lost. He is about to be killed. Jesus says to them, Do not weep. This is not the first time he has used this expression. He spoke these same words to address people who were mourning the death of someone they loved. He told those who were mourning a son who died, do not weep. He told those mourning the death of Jair Jairus' daughter, do not weep. These mourners did not need to weep because Jesus had come to raise those children from the dead. As Jesus approaches his own death, he tells the women of Jerusalem, do not weep for me. In doing so, he is comforting them and giving them hope on this day of darkness. Jesus is reminding them that he already has shown his power over death. If he is able to raise other people from the dead, he will be able to raise himself from the dead. Jesus is inviting this woman of Jerusalem 
and, so, and us to look closer. On the surface, they see a man condemned, beaten, scourged, and about to be nailed to a cross. But on a deeper level, he is the resurrection and the life. He is the one who shines light in the thickest darkness. He gives hope to those who despair. He gives life to those in death. Yes, he is about to be killed. But take courage and do not weep. He will rise again. Let us pray. Dear Jesus, when I experience trials and sufferings, when I encounter my own crosses, help me to look closer and seek your hand, still guiding me and strengthening me. Help me to not despair or become despondent, but to put my trust in you. If I try to bear my crosses on my own, I will become anxious and, and overwhelmed. But with you, all things are possible. You who comforted the sorrowful, healed the sick, and raised the dead, you strengthen me when I am weak. You can guide me when I cannot see, and you carry me when I feel I cannot walk any further. Jesus, I trust in you. The Ninth Station Jesus falls for the third time. We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you. Because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. Jesus is so close to the summit, but he can no longer stay on his feet. Completely drained, he falls a third time and lies on the ground in utter fatigue. Our sinfulness takes its toll on him. In this third fall, we can consider how Jesus feels the weight of another aspect of humanity's threefold wound, the lust of the flesh. Jesus taught that the pure of heart shall see God. When we are pure in our thoughts, glances, and actions, we can see God more clearly in the people around us. We can love them. But when we look at others in a lustful way, it is harder to notice the image of God in them. Instead of loving them, we fall into using them. We view them more as objects to be used than as people to be loved for their own sake. A disciple of Jesus must be vigilant in maintaining purity of heart. Guarding our purity keeps our hearts free to love. But each time we give into impure thoughts or glances, we train our hearts to use people. And we add to the burden Jesus has to bear on his way to Calvary. Let us pray. Dear Jesus, I long for interior freedom. Please free me from whatever slavery to lust I might experience. Help me to guard my eyes. Help me to guard my thoughts. Help me to be pure in all my actions. But if I fall, I will remember your example on the way to Calvary. You got up and tried again, and so can I. No matter how many times I fall, in purity or in any area of my life, you are not there to condemn or reject me. You love me and offer me your mercy. Jesus, you fall in order to meet me in my sin. You fall in order to help me rise again. Lift me up, Jesus. Help me to carry this cross. I cannot carry it on my own. The Tenth Station Jesus is stripped of his garments. We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you. Because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. When Jesus finally arrives at Calvary, the soldiers offer him wine mingled with myrrh, a kind of narcotic to dull the pain of the crucifixion and induce sleep. But Jesus refuses it. He wants to remain alert and give himself completely for us on the cross. He desires to enter fully into the sacrifice and drink the last drop from the cup of, the su of this suffering. He makes a free gift of total love. The soldiers then tear the garments from his wounded skin, leaving his body completely exposed to the elements. From the sole of the feet even to the head, there is no soundness in it, but bruises and sores and bleeding wounds. They are not pressed out or bound up, or softened with oil. Naked, exposed, shamed from his arrest in Gethsemane to his arrival at Golgotha, Jesus has been bound, blindfolded, slapped, beaten, and spit at. He has been falsely accused, mocked, scourged, and pierced with thorns in his head. Now he is stripped of his garments and left painfully exposed and ashamed. All along the way, however, we never hear a single complaint from him. Though he has been stripped of all comfort, stripped of all human dignity, all basic human dignity, and now even stripped of his garments, he does not say a word. His silence speaks volumes. 
about his humility. Like a lamb led to the slaughter, he opened not his mouth. Let us pray. Dear Jesus, I am ashamed of how many times I complain, when I am cold or hungry, when I have to wait, when someone does not treat me well, when I cannot get what I want. Too often, I get frustrated when things don't go my way. I complain when I have the slightest discomfort. I get annoyed when someone does not do what I hoped they would do, and I am quick to defend myself whenever I'm, I am misunderstood. I looked at all you endured, and I realized how much I lack courage to face the little inconveniences and sufferings of daily life. I looked at how you did not pr protest or defend yourself, and I realized how much I lack humility and how much I want to be right and accepted by others. Help me, Jesus, to bear sufferings and humiliations with greater love. When I am stripped of comfort, stripped of my possessions, stripped of what I want to do, help me to be like you, Jesus, and put my life in the Father's hands. The eleventh station. Jesus is nailed to the cross. We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you. Because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. The soldiers put Jesus' body on the cross and drive the nails into his hands and feet. The Son of God is now crucified. The Roman soldiers might have expected to hear a cry from Jesus at this moment. When criminals were crucified, they often shouted out curses, cursing their executioners, cursing the Roman Empire, cursing the day they were born. But the soldiers never would have expected to hear what Jesus spoke that day. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Forgiveness. How could Jesus forgive them after all they did to him? Forgiveness is one of the most beautiful expressions of love. And Jesus shows us the two ways to forgive those who hurt us. First, he prays for his enemies. He turns to the Father and intercedes for them. Second, he has compassion for the people who are hurting him. He sees that they do not realize what they are doing. If they truly understood that Jesus is the Son of God, the one coming to save them, they would not have nailed him to the cross. But they do not truly understand their own actions. With love and mercy, Jesus freely chooses to forgive even the ones who so cruelly drove the nails into his hands and feet. Let us pray. Dear Jesus, I am sorry for still holding grudges and resentment toward the people who have wounded me. There might be some people who have hurt me so much I find it hard to forgive them deeply from my heart. But I want to be like you. No matter what they have done to me, I can still pray for them like you did and sincerely wish God's blessing upon them. Help me to say, Father, forgive them. And please give me a heart of compassion, remembering that many people who hurt us are deeply hurt themselves. They act from their own wounds. Make my heart like yours, Jesus. May I see beyond the hurt they have inflicted on me and realize the deeper truth they know not what they do. The Twelfth Station Jesus dies on the cross. We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you. Because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. A great darkness covers the land. The supreme moment is approaching. Jesus' entire life mission is about to reach its climax. His love drives him to enter our sufferings and the effects of our sin, even taking on death, death on the cross. Before he breathes his last, he turns all his attention to the Father. My God, my God, it is finished. Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Consider those very last words. Jesus shows us he is not a passive victim, a tragic figure, who is captured by the Romans and forced against his will to suffer this horrific and humiliating death. No, Jesus freely gave up his life. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. He actively offers his entire life to the Father as a gift of love for the sake of our salvation. He says, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Let us pray. Dear Jesus, you gave everything for us on the cross. You held nothing back. And you gave up your life, not just for the salvation of the world. You did it for me personally. 
My sins have consequences. My sins led you to the cross, but you went to your death in order to bring me back to life. In your final words, Jesus, you entrusted your spirit and the souls of all men and women of every age into the Father's hands. And the Father's hands are trustworthy. May we entrust our entire lives, all our dreams, hopes, joys, and sufferings to the Father like you did, holding nothing back. The thirteenth station. Jesus is taken down from the cross. We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you. Because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. Jesus is dead. The earth quakes. The temple curtain is torn in two. The soldier pierces Jesus' side, and blood and water flow from his body. But no one breaks Jesus' bones. Witnessing all that took place at Calvary, the Roman centurion says, Truly, this man was the Son of God. The corpse is taken down and placed in Mary's arms. As she holds the lifeless body of her son, she grieves in untold grief, not just that of a mother mourning the loss of a child, which is tragic enough, but this mother, Mary, our mother, is the most perfect, most pure mother, completely full of grace. She understands more than anyone else that her son, who just suffered this most horrific execution, is no ordinary child, but the Holy Son of God. She feels not only the sorrow of her own loss, but also something of the pain of the entire human family, who is lost and suffering without Jesus. And yet, even in the depths of her mourning, she holds on to hope. Indeed, the mysterious events following Jesus' death point to something more. The water and blood from Jesus' side point to the gifts of new life he will give us in baptism in the Eucharist. The unbroken bones of Jesus reveal him to be the true Passover lamb, whose bones were not to be broken. And the one person we might least expect, a Gentile, the Roman centurion overseeing the crucifixion, becomes the first person at Calvary to reveal Jesus' true identity. He represents one of the biggest conversions to take place on Good Friday. This, most likely of all men, comes to say, Truly, this was the Son of God. Let us pray. Dear Mary, you carried Jesus in your womb. You held him so many times when he was a baby. You embraced him often when he was an adult. But now you hold his body one last time before he is brought to his tomb. I can only imagine the sorrow you feel at this moment. I am sorry that my sins have contributed to all your son endured this day. I am sorry for the pain my sins have thus caused you. I wish to be near you, Mary, to comfort you in some small way in your moment of sorrow. In thanksgiving for all he has done for me, I give my heart to your son, and I promise to do all I can to be faithful to him in the future. May I always say yes to Jesus and thus live my life in a way that adds to your joy and not your sorrow. The fourteenth station, Jesus is laid in the tomb. We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you. Because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. A man named Joseph of Arimathea, a secret disciple of Jesus, musters up the courage to ask Pilate for the body so that it may receive a proper burial. Jesus' body is wrapped in a linen shroud, brought to a garden, and laid in a rock-hewn tomb. The stone is placed in front of the entrance and sealed. All is quiet now. Inside the tomb, all is still. If we could enter in, we would only see a lifeless body. Yet the Lord says, Be still and know that I am, that I am God. Jesus' body lies in the tomb, but he is still busy at work. Throughout his public ministry, Jesus was constantly reaching out to the lost, the sinners, the task collectors, the drunkards. The, gen the Gentiles, those possessed by demons, and those who had died. He had a pressing need to give light to those in darkness and fill the lost with his life. Now, though his corpse remains in the garden tomb, Jesus continues his ministry. His spirit will go to Sheol, to the land of the dead, to the righteous souls who await their Savior. He will bring the gospel to the just so that they can enter heaven and see the face of God. Jesus himself foretold that the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God 
and those who hear will live. Let us pray. Dear Jesus, you did not just die on Good Friday. You also began your descent to the dead. I beg you to do that work in me today. Descend into the dark corners of my soul. Fill me with your light. Descend into the areas of my soul that are stagnant, wounded, or spiritually dead. Fill me with your life. When I feel like I am going through a rut in, me, in my spiritual life, when my prayer is dry, when my relationships are strained, when I feel like I am just going through the motions and I am not sure where my life is going, help me to remember the mystery of your body being laid in the tomb. Help me to trust that, even when I don't sense your presence, you are still busy at work in the depths of my soul. In closing, let us pray. Dear Jesus, thank you for all you have done for me in these 14 stations of the cross. Your passion and death reveal how serious my sin is, but they also reveal your unfathomable love for me. By meditating on these stations, may I always stay close to you. Give me the grace always to stay by you and never leave you in the stations of my life. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. We thank you again for joining us and for praying with us. If these particular stations spoke to you and you'd like a physical copy, again, these are the pocket guide to the Stations of the Cross um, by Dr. Shree and Essential Press. God bless you all. We'll see you again next week. <laughs>